Today's topic for the discussion is anatomy of the anterior abdominal wall. This is Dr. Yusuf signing from Aljof University. These are the specific objectives which we will cover in this lecture. The first one is describe the formation of the anterior abdominal wall regarding its muscles, aponeurosis, fascia and ligaments. The second is describe the rectus sheath at various levels namely above the costal margin, between the costal margin and the arcuate line and below the arcuate line. The third is list the contents of the rectus sheath. Fourth is define the inguinal canal and its various boundaries. Next is explain the mechanics of the inguinal canal. The sixth is list the structures passing through inguinal canal in both male and female. Seven is define hernia. Eight is compare the direct and indirect inguinal hernia. Nine is explain the basis of other hernias related to GIT namely the umbilical hernia, diaphragmatic hernia, incisional hernia, femoral and epigastric hernias. The last one is outline the different surgical incision and conventional lines which divide the abdomen into various quadrants. So these are some of the specific objectives uh, around which our lecture will revolve. To begin with the abdominal wall. Abdominal wall is actually divided into two parts the anterior abdominal wall as well as the posterior abdominal wall. In this lecture what we will be covering is the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, so in some other lecture we will uh, try to cover the posterior abdominal wall but in this as, you, as I said before it will be the anterior abdominal wall. So the anterior abdominal wall is made up of multiple layers of muscles and fascia so that we will study one by one. Okay, And this is a very important uh, structure which will be studied in nature as well as it helps in protection of the, uh, the visceras which are deep inside the abdomen. So abdominal wall is very uh, important in uh, protection of the, the structures deep inside and it also encloses the, the whole of the abdominal cavity. And as you know there are major structures which are or the organs which are deep inside like the stomach, the intestine, the liver, so many structures are there deep inside the abdomen. And this abdomen will be divided into uh, nine quadrants by the uh, presence of two vertical and two horizontal lines. These quadrants are important because if you want to approach any particular structure at that time, we'll mention that it is present in particular quadrant. So uh, in that fashion, you will be easily able to trace the uh, that particular structure in that region. Okay. So if you want to trace mm, the spleen, uh, we'll mention it is present in the left hypochondrium and if you want to talk about the, the liver it will be occupying more than one quadrant like the right hypochondrium, the epigastric as well as even partly it enters into the left hypochondrium. If you want to talk about the, uh, the appendix we mentioned that it will be present in the right iliac fossa. So in this fashion uh, this will uh, help in uh, identifying the structures or tracing the tra that uh, particular structure in that particular quadrant. The nine quadrants are formed by uh, two vertical and two horizontal lines. The two vertical lines are on uh, the on either side. These are the mid clavicular line, the line passing through the mid point of the uh, the clavicle, and it vertically runs downwards, and it also passes through the mid point of the inguinal ligament. Okay, so these are called as the mid clavicular line. Similarly, on either side, right and left. Similarly, we have two horizontal lines. The first horizontal line is called as the subcostal plane because it will be passing below the, the costal cartilages, the lower lowermost part of the costal cartilages and joints on either side. So this is called as the subcostal plane because it is below the costa, the ribs. And the second plane is called as the intertubercular plane because this will be uh, connecting the two tubercles on the iliac crust on either side. So this is called an intertubercular plane. Then we have the subcostal plane. These are the two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. These are the mid clavicular lines on either side. So this will divide the whole of the abdomen into nine quadrants. So now what are the quadrants? One is the hypochondrium on either side. This is the left hypochondrium. Similarly, we have the right hypochondrium. So these are the two right and left hypochondria. Then in the middle we have the epigastric region. This is the epigastric region. Uh, similarly on just opposite to that below we have the hypogastric or it is also called as the pubic. 
okay so this this is the epigastric so this becomes a hypogastric or pubic and here because there is umbilicus this is called as the umbilical region or the quadrant then here on either side we have the left lumbar as well as the right lumbar then below here we have the left iliac and the right iliac so these are the nine quadrants the right and left hypochondrium uh, left and right lumbar and left and right iliac regions then epigastric then umbilical as well as the hypogastric or it is also called as the pubic region so these are the nine uh, regions of quadrants which are uh, formed by two vertical and two horizontal lines so these uh, quadrants are important to trace any particular structure and give the insertion and trace the particular structure okay so this is about the quadrants now let's uh, study the layers which together form the abdominal wall so the layers of the abdominal wall consist of the external to the internal wall or from outside to inside these are the structures from beginning from the skin if you see this picture there's the skin here and then we have deeper structures similarly here if you can see once you start incising uh, that will be the the first will be the uh, the skin then you trace uh, the superficial fascia superficial fascia is very typical here uh, because it has two layers especially in the lower part of the abdomen where it is called the superficial layer of uh, fatty layer that will be called as the uh, camphor's fascia or fascia of camphor and deep inside there is membranous layer which is called as the uh, scarpa's fascia so these are the two layers which are very typical to the the abdomen especially in the lower part one part of the superficial layer will be uh, uh, the fatty layer and deep inside we have the membranous layer then going deep inside after this uh, uh, the superficial fascia then going deep inside we have uh, trace the the abdominal wall made up of muscles so the first one will be the external oblique inside deep inside will be the internal oblique deepest will be the transverse abdominal these are the three um, muscular layers which will be present then uh, deep inside if you go there uh, there will be a uh, fascia this is called as the fascia transversalis which will separate the abdominal contents and the peritoneum from the muscles so this is called as the transversalis fascia and deep inside that will be the peritoneum and uh, there later we have the all the organs deep inside so this is how you can trace the structures from outside to inside the most superficial with the skin then the the fascia superficial fascia especially as i said there are two layers fatty layer which is called as the fascia camphor and then deep inside we have the membranous layer which is called as the fascia scarpa then we have three muscular layers external oblique internal oblique and transverse abdominis and deepest will be the transversalis fascia and deep to that will be the peritoneum now let's study the muscles which will be forming the anterior abdominal wall the main muscles which will be giving the strength to the uh, the anti abdominal wall as well as their aponeurosis they are in pairs so on either side the first one muscle first muscle will be the external oblique as the name indicates it is externally present as well as obliquely placed so that's what is called external oblique then deep to that if you cut this muscle then deep inside you can see the internal oblique we'll see this muscles again in detail later then deep inside will be the internal oblique deepest will be the transverse abdominis so these will be the three layers uh, of muscles in the anti abdominal wall apart from that there is also a muscle in the just beside the midline on either side this is called as the rectus abdominis rectus abdominis okay we will see this muscle also then there are two smaller muscles one is called as the cremastric muscle or cremastral muscle which will be present only in case of male and then there is a small pyramid shaped muscle which is called as the uh, pyramidalis to begin with uh, the first one is the external oblique which you can see here so this is the external oblique muscle as i said it is the name indicates it is externally pre present deep to the skin and the superficial fascia then it is obliquely placed so what is the origin of this muscle as well as insertion the origin of this muscle is from the lower eight ribs so that uh, that is the 5th 6th 7th 8th 9th 10th and 11th and 12th ribs so this will be the origin of this muscle you can see here so it is taking origin from the the lower eight ribs and these fibers will run downwards as well as medially this the direction of this uh, fibers 
can be imagined by putting your hands in your pockets on either side and imagine the direction of your fingers will be the direction of uh, your uh, the uh, fiber direction of fibers of this external oblique muscle okay so this is how it will look like okay so the insertion of this muscle will be into the anterior two-thirds of the outer lip of the iliac crust iliac crust as you know this is the iliac crust so there are uh, three uh, important uh, distinguishing uh, parts here the outermost will be called as the outer lip the inside we have the inner lip and in between we have the the middle surface okay so outer lip inner lip as well as the middle broad surface okay so this muscle will be attached to the anterior two-thirds so this is the whole iliac crust so anterior two-thirds of the iliac crust on the outer lip on the outer lip of the iliac crust anterior two-thirds okay so that is the uh, the insertion of this muscle apart from that it also becomes if you can see here this muscle is changing its color this is to indicate that it becomes aponeurotic so it becomes aponeurosis what do you mean by aponeurosis what is the difference between the tendon and aponeurosis in case of the tendon the muscle will be getting inserted to a particular bone in case of and it will be a, a fibrous structure as well as it will be uh, uh, condensed and fixed to one particular part of the bone but in case of aponeurosis it becomes fibrous and it becomes flat and fascia like and it spreads and get inserted um, uh, either uh, into the deep fascia or to the opposite side here in case of this side it will be getting inserted to the opposite side of the muscle upon your of the other, uh, other side so this uh, is nothing but the modification of this muscle uh, it becomes uh, aponeurotic and instead of getting inserted to the bone it goes uh, superficially and uh, get inserted to this uh, line here which is called as uh, the linear alba linear alba is a um, midline uh, structure it is nothing but a line formed by the uh, fusion of both the aponeurosis from either side and this is whitish in color and it extends from the zephyr process up to the pubic crest here as well as the pubic tubercle so this whole line is called as the linear alba so this line is important especially for the surgeons previously they used to do surgeries on this linea alba because this is the least vascular uh, area so there used to be less bleeding but it has many of its own complications we will discuss about that now they have stopped doing surgeries on this linea alba okay so this is the linea alba on which this muscle will be inserted it is not only inserted to the bone on the outer lip of the uh, iliac crust anterior two-thirds but also um, a part of this muscle uh, will become a aponeurotic and get inserted to this linea alba extending from the zephyr process up to the pubic tubercle uh, uh, a part of this muscle between uh, this bony insertion and the linea alba uh, will descend downwards and it twists itself at this particular point and it uh, modifies this especially the aponeurotic part uh, uh, twist and turns inside and this becomes a very important structure called as the inguinal ligament a very important structure clinically so this is called as the inguinal ligament the lower border is thickened and folded to form the inguinal ligament extending from the anterior superior leg spine up to the pubic tubercle here okay so this whole thing extending from the anti superior leg spine up to the pubic tubercle this is called as the inguinal ligament so inguinal ligament is not a true ligament but it is uh, just the modification the aponeurotic part of the uh, external oblique muscle okay and what is ligament it is connecting between the two bones usually it will be a fibrous structure okay uh, true ligaments which will be connecting two ends of the bones or the two bones okay but here in case of this uh, 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 this uh, ligament this is not a true ligament but it is part of the the external oblique muscle but because it is between the uh, two parts of the bone one is the anti leg spine up to the pubic tubercle so that's why it is called as inguinal ligament if not it is not a true ligament but it is part of the external oblique muscle which has twisted below okay Coming to the nerve supply, it is supplied, all the muscles of the anti-abdominal wall are supplied by the lower 6th thoracic nerves. 
you can see this picture so this is how it is supplied by this the t7 t8 t9 t10 t11 and t12 so some books mention the lower uh, five thoracic and the subcostal subcostal is nothing but the the 12th uh, uh, thoracic nerve that will be called as the subcostal subcostal uh, nerve because it is below the costas the ribs okay going to the next muscle that is the internal oblique once you cut the uh, external oblique deep inside we can trace the internal oblique so the origin of this muscle and the direction of this fibers is uh, as the name indicated it is internal so that's why it is inside that's what is called internal oblique it, these fibers are also oblique but it is just opposite to the the direction of fibers of the external oblique this is how you can identify this muscle okay so what is the origin of this muscle this will be taking origin from the lateral two thirds of the inguinal ligament as well as the anterior two thirds of the iliac crust yeah, anterior two thirds of the iliac crust the on the anterior two thirds of the iliac crust the external oblique was getting inserted but in case of the internal oblique this is the origin of this muscle so it will be taking origin from the anterior two thirds of the iliac crust but in the middle part between the outer and inner lip as well as the lateral two-thirds of the inguinal ligament lateral two-thirds of the inguinal ligament and then it runs upwards okay and can then get inserted uh, especially in the muscle into the lower third and fourth ribs some of the fibers goes to the third and fourth rib and it also forms a broad upon neurosis and can get inserted to the the linea alba Linear, just like the tau the external oblique this also get inserted to the linea alba and also it also get some fibers also get inserted to the 7th 8th and 9th coastal cartilages okay so this is the insertion of this muscle and the direction of this muscle will be the muscle fibers will be just opposite to that of the at part uh, almost at uh, uh, perpendicular to the external oblique muscle fibers okay then deep inside there is one more muscle if you cut the internal oblique then you can see one more muscle that is called as the transverse abdominis so this is called as transverse abdominis because the fibers are almost transverse here they are called as oblique because they were oblique but in case of the transverse abdominis the fibers are almost horizontal on either side okay so the origin of this muscle will be from the lateral one third of the inguinal ligament this was taking origin from the lateral two thirds of the inguinal ligament. this will be taking origin from the lateral one third of the inguinal ligament as well as the anterior uh, two thirds of the iliac crust but in from the inner lip okay that is the difference between the three muscles the external oblique will be taking origin from the iliac crust but outer lip the internal oblique will be taking origin from the anterior two thirds of the iliac crust but from the middle part and the transverse abdominis will be taking origin from the anterior two thirds of the iliac crust but the inner lip so that is the difference between the three muscles even though they are taking origin from the iliac crust okay as well as this will be taking origin from the lateral one third of the iliac crust but in case of the internal oblique it was taking origin from the lateral two thirds of the inguinal ligament so this will be taking origin from the lateral one third of the inguinal ligament as well as the the anterior two thirds of the iliac crust inner lip so this will be the origin of this muscle then the fibers will run transversely and again this also becomes aponeurotic and get inserted to the the broad aponeurus of the linea alba so all the three muscles become aponeurotic and they get inserted to the uh, linea alba from either side and they fuse together okay so they all from either side come and fuse at this particular point called as the linea alba and this all these muscles are supplied by the the lower six thoracic nerves okay then coming to the uh, one more important muscle that is called as the rectus abdominis this is the rectus abdominis if you uh, cut and uh, cut the aponeurosis which is over this muscle then you can see deep inside this is how the rectus abdominis will look like okay so this muscle is very typical that usually the muscles will take origin from the upper part and get inserted below but this muscle will be taking origin from here because the mobile part is the ribs okay this is fixed so it will be taking origin from two heads lateral from the pubic crust and medial from the anterior pubic ligament as well as the tubercle okay so it will begin as two heads then join together and run upwards and get inserted to the fifth to seventh coastal cartilages get inserted to the fifth to seventh coastal cartilages as well as partly into the xiphoid process also 
okay so this is the origin here and the insertion will be above and this is also like other muscles it is also supplied by the lower six thoracic nerves these are the four muscles which are important muscles which will be uh, 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 protective in nature which will be sturdy and which give shape to the the abdomen the external oblique and internal oblique transverse abdominis as well as the rectus abdominis apart from this uh, there are other two muscles which are uh, very small muscles one is called as the pyramidalis as i said it is a very small triangular shaped muscle that's what is called as pyramid so this is called as pyramidalis so it is triangular in shape and it is said to be a rudimentary muscle and it is just in front of the rectus abdominis in the lower part so near the origin of the rectus abdominis it will be a small muscle on either side again so all these muscles are in pairs then the last muscle which is seen only in case of the males is called as the cremaster cremastric muscle okay so this is uh, present in the scrotum this is the testis here and this testis is covered by a, a muscle which is a important muscle this is called as the cremaster muscle okay so this is seen only in case of males it is not present in case of female so in case of female there are five muscles in case of male there will be six muscles what is the function of this muscle we will talk about that later okay now coming to the the rectus sheath rectus sheath is nothing but the aponeurosis of the all the three muscles external oblique internal oblique and transverse abdominis which will be co covering the rectus abdominis it is an aponeurotic sheath in front of the abdominal uh, abdomen covering the rectus abdominis muscle so you can see here this is nothing but the aponeurosis of the external oblique internal oblique as well as the transverse abdominis which is covering this muscle called as the rectus sheath if you see this muscle anteriorly this uh, this uh, sheath is complete from about onwards if you can see it is completely covering the rectus abdominis but if you see posteriorly and you can see that there are tendinous intersections these are tendinous intersections which will be uh, connected uh, connecting the muscle rectus abdominis with the rectus sheath anterior wall okay so if you want to strip this uh, rectus sheath then you will face this uh, tendinous inter uh, intersections which will be connected to it if you see the posterior wall this is incomplete it extends from above but as you trace it down you can see here this muscle is cut rectus sometimes so that you can see the posterior wall so if you can see here this ends here in the form of an arch this is called as the arcuate line and below this there is no rectus sheath so directly what you will be facing will be the transverse abdominis uh, the uh, the transversalis fascia okay so the fascia will directly come in contact with the muscle okay so this muscle rectus abdominis is cut to show you the the posterior wall which is incomplete so it uh, ends as an arch like fashion in the lower part that is called uh, the arcuate line and below that there will be only the transversalis fascia which will be in contact with the posterior surface of the rectus abdominis now uh, we'll see how exactly this uh, rectus sheath is uh, covering this muscle okay so uh, it will be studied uh, or uh, we'll see we will see the formation of this muscle in the above the costal margin between the costal margin and arcuate line and below the arcuate, arcuate line how it is there so here you can see the rectus abdominis muscle the rectus sheath has been removed and here the muscle also has been removed so you can see the posterior wall this is a posterior wall and this wall is ending here in the form of uh, arcuate line okay so above the costal margin if you see the anterior wall is formed by all uh, the external oblique muscle because this muscle will be in the front of this and extends the origin of this muscle will be uh, from all uh, lower six uh, as well as the lower eight ribs so it will be covering this uh, muscle also uh, and it will in the form of an aponeurosis and this is the external oblique muscle which will be covering the upper part of the uh, rectus uh, 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 rectus abdominis or the it forms the rectus sheath okay so the rectus sheath uh, in the above the costal margin will be formed by the external oblique only okay then uh, posteriorly it will be deficient because this muscle is getting inserted to the costal cartilages here this rectus abdominis so there will be no posterior wall because it is totally adherent to this uh, the costal cartilages so only there will be anterior wall okay 
between the coastal margin and the arcuate line between the coastal margin and the arcuate line here is the arcuate line so if you take a section at this level then you can see this is how it is formed so this is the section of the whole of the abdomen you can see the posterior abdominal wall this is the anti abdominal wall you can see the external oblique internal oblique as well as transverse abdominus uh, and here you can see the rectus abdominus and these three are becoming a polyneurosis and they cover this rectus abdominus and if you see it closely you can see that the external oblique will be uh, it becomes aponeurotic and it covers the the anterior surface of the rectus abdominis okay it covers the anterior surface so it becomes anti wall if you see you trace this transverse abdominis it goes behind it from the posterior wall of the uh, rectus sheath and if you see the internal oblique this is typical that it comes uh, to the lateral border then it splits into two laminae the anterior laminae joins with the external oblique aponeurosis and form the anterior wall of the rectus sheath and the posterior laminae will join with the transverse abdominis aponeurosis and it form the posterior wall of the rectus sheath okay so this is how the uh, internal oblique splits into external oblique will form the anterior wall the transverse abdominis form the posterior wall of the rectus sheath and the internal oblique will split into two anterior laminae and posterior laminae anterior laminae will pass anterior to the muscle and posterior laminae will go behind and it form the posterior wall so this is how the uh, rectus sheath will be covering the rectus abdominis so the anterior wall of the rectus sheath is from the external, external oblique muscle as you have seen as well as the anterior lamina of the internal oblique the posterior wall as you have seen this is the posterior wall which will be formed by the posterior laminae of the internal oblique as well as the aponeurosis of the transverse abdominis okay then below if you take a section below the uh, arcuate line here is the arcuate line so if you take a section at this below the arcuate line then the posterior wall is deficient and the aponeurosis of all the three muscles will join together and it covers only the anteriorly so if you can see the external oblique is forming the anterior wall the internal oblique also joins with it and form the anterior wall as well as even the transverse abdominis will go in the front and it covers the uh, rectus abdominis in the front only so that's why the posterior wall is deficient and you can see all the three aponeurosis of all the three muscles will form the anterior wall of the rectus sheath okay so this is how it is uh, formed at different levels okay so below the arcuate line aponeurosis of all the three muscles will form the anterior wall the posterior wall is deficient and it ends as an arcuate line okay so this is the formation of the the rectus abdomen uh, the rectus sheath uh, above the costal margin between the costal margin as well as the arcuate line as well as below the arcuate line so these are the pictures which are depicting the same okay so this in the middle part and this in the lower part okay now coming to the contents what are the contents of this rectus sheath okay one we have seen already one is the rectus abdominis there are two muscles one is the rectus abdominis along with that this small muscle here this is also uh, comes uh, under the rectus sheath so these are the two important muscles which are within this rectus sheath so rectus sheath is nothing but the aponeurosis of the all the three muscles and it will be covering the rectus abdominis from anteriorly and posteriorly except the lower part in the uh, posterior uh, wall which will be deficient so this rectus sheath will be having two content two muscles one is the rectus abdominis as well as the pyramidalis along with there are two uh, important arteries which will be supplying this muscle one, one is the superior epigastric as well as the inferior epigastric muscle which will be supplying the anti-abdominal wall along with that there will be two veins one is the superior epigastric as well as the inferior epigastric vein which will be run, running along with these arteries along with this the main muscles which will the main nerves which will be supplying the lower part of the abdomen that is the lower six thoracic nerves which will be supplying in this uh, rectus abdominis as well as the other muscles so these are the lower six thoracic nerves five lower thoracic and the subcostal as i said it can be said as lower six or lower five uh, intercostal as well as the subcostal below okay so these are the nerves which will be forming the content so these are some of the contents of the rectus sheath two muscles rectus abdominis as well as the pyramidalis two arteries superior and inferior epigastric artery two veins superior and inferior epigastric vein as well as six uh, thoracic nerves lower six thoracic nerves so what is the main function of this uh, rectus sheath 
one is it maintain the strength to the anti abdominal wall when you uh, do the gym at that time you can see the six packs this is uh, where you can prominently see and the six packs are because of this tendons intersection where this part of the muscle is bulge and the remaining part here where the tendons intersections are there there it will be depressed so that is how you can see the six packs and and this will be giving strength to the anti abdominal wall because all other muscles are horizontal almost horizontal and this vertical muscle and this uh, sheath will be covering this important muscle here okay so it will be giving the strength to the anti abdominal wall as well as it also prevents um, the bowing of the rectus muscle when you bend uh, in the front uh, forward bending uh, if there is no rectus sheath then this muscle will fall in front okay it will uh, uh, projected it will be projected in the front so this is prevented by the presence of this rectus sheath which will give the strength to this muscle as well as it prevents bowing of the rectus muscle okay so these are some of the important functions of the rectus sheath so this was all about the uh, six muscles uh, of the anti abdominal wall as well as the rectus sheath okay the inguinal canal is a very important uh, canal uh, clinically and it is made up of muscular part as well as the aponeurotic part of the external oblique, internal oblique as well as the transverse abdominis muscle all together will form a canal just above the inguinal ligament, uh, medial half of the inguinal ligament. Uh, this is the inguinal ligament here uh, from the medial half, uh, in the uh, just above the medial half of the inguinal ligament you can see this canal. Uh, which is running from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring and it's almost four centimeters in length total length from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring and this directed downwards as well as forwards as well as medially it is directed medially downwards as well as forwards because the deep inguinal ring is deep inside uh, which is the opening in the transversalis fascia and the superficial inguinal ring is an opening in the external oblique muscle so it becomes almost oblique and it is uh, directed forwards from deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring so here also you can see this is the inguinal ligament just above that there is a canal uh, in the medial half uh, this is the superficial inguinal ring which is can be seen outside just uh, below the external oblique muscle upon your osseous and the deep inguinal ring will be connecting this canal to the uh, contents of the abdominal cavity so that is an opening in the transversalis fascia and this canal is uh, uh, much narrow in case of the female uh, 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 and it is uh, so that's why even the hernias are less common especially the inguinal hernias are less common in case of the female because of the narrowness of this canal this canal is said to be a, uh, a consequence of the erect posture of the human being. If you imagine that the, uh, uh, according to the theory of evolution, if the, uh, the primates have been evolved to the human beings, and they say this is because of the, uh, the erect posture of the, uh, uh, of the human being, and this canal is uh, actually uh, this opening is uh, not seen in case of the primate so that's why the inguinal hernias are not seen in case of the lower animals like the monkeys and other apes but it is said to be a, a byproduct of uh, the effect of er erect posture of the human being so that's why this uh, uh, has developed and this is uh, just the consequence of air posture so this canal can be seen in case of the human beings and this canal is very important because sometimes the abdominal contents protrude through this canal which leads to a condition called as inguinal hernia we'll talk about that later before we go to the inguinal hernia we should know what exactly are the contents of this inguinal canal why it is so important this canal is important because it gives passage for a very important structure in case of the male that is the spermatic cord through which the sperms will be drained from the testis into the external world okay so this is the spermatic cord if you can see it in this picture so which is coming through the deep inguinal ring and it comes out through the superficial inguinal ring and uh, descend down into the scrotum uh, in case of the female instead of the uh, spermatic cord because the females don't have spermatic cord 
uh, inside there will be a round ligament of uterus which is a very important ligament uh, to hold the uterus in its position so it is a fibro muscular or fibrous uh, ligament which is mainly responsible for the antiversion and antiflexion of the uterus okay one of the many ligaments okay so this will be uh, the content one is the spermatic cord in case of male and this and in case of female it will be round ligament of uterus the second important structure which will be present in this canal will be the ilioinguinal nerve if you can see here along with the uh, the spermatic cord you can see a structure coming this is the nerve this is the ilioinguinal nerve which is a very important nerve which will be uh, uh, mainly uh, for the sensation around the uh, around the genital system coming to the boundaries of this canal canal has an anterior wall a posterior wall a roof a floor as well as inlet and outlet outlet we have seen this is the outlet that is the superficial inguinal ring inlet will be deep inguinal ring it will have an anterior this is the anterior wall made up of the the external oblique uh, muscle as well as its aponeurosis then the posterior wall will go into its details one by one the anterior wall as you know it is very superficial just deep to the skin and the muscle so the first structure if you uh, cut across uh, to approach the inguinal canal will be the skin then you have the superficial fascia which as you already seen there are two uh, superficial fascias fascia of camphor as well as the fascia of scarpa then deep to that will be the the main muscle which is the external oblique muscle this is the muscle here external oblique muscle uh, most of it converts itself into an aponeurosis and it runs downwards and it twists on itself okay partly it is on the lateral part it is muscular uh, if not the most of the part will be by the aponeurosis of the external thing okay so it will twist and turn in itself inside and it uh, leads to the uh, the uh, formation of the canal deep inside this muscle or the aponeurosis of this muscle to be more uh, 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 precise the lateral one third is also covered by along with the external oblique muscle because as you have seen the origin of the internal oblique as well as some fibers of even the transverse abdominis will be taking origin from the the inguinal ligament itself so those fibers can also be seen especially the internal oblique muscle will be forming the anterior wall in the lateral one third coming to the posterior wall posterior wall as you have seen it is totally deficient it is just made up of the fascia that is called as the transversalis fascia okay so if you can see here this is the uh, the spermatic cord which is running and all the muscles have been removed in the front and in the above so you can see deep inside you can see just the transversalis fascia which is entirely uh, forming the posterior wall and partly it is also covered by uh, a conjoint tendon on the medial side conjoint tendon is the tendon uh, that is formed by the aponeurosis of the internal oblique as well as the transverse abdominis fusion of the inter internal oblique as well as the transverse abdominis on the medial uh, half okay so that also forms uh, the posterior wall in the medial half as well as uh, there is also a part of the reflected part of the uh, reflected part of the inguinal ligament so this is the inguinal ligament which is nothing but the aponeurosis of the external oblique as i said it will twist and turn and go deep inside and it uh, converts itself into a canal a part of it also get reflected here okay so that is called as the reflected part of the inguinal ligament and that also partly forms the the posterior wall in the medial one fourth okay so here this is uh, just again to show the the extra oblique muscle and its aponeurosis which has twisted and turned uh, uh, medially or inside deep inside and then it uh, forms the inguinal ligament here this is the inguinal ligament extending from the uh, the anti superior leg spine to the pubic tubercle and this as i said this inguinal ligament is not a true ligament but it is part of the muscle but because it is between the two ligament uh, two bones and this is aponeurosis that's what is called a ligament if not it is not a true ligament now if you can see uh, the same uh, uh, inguinal canal 
uh, you can see this is the internal oblique muscle which is taking origin from the lateral uh, two thirds or one third of the inguinal ligament and it also forms the the anterior wall uh, partly and then it uh, if you can see here it runs above that and it forms the roof over the uh, canal okay so when we study the roof then we will study that also along with that even you can see the transverse abdominis that is also taking partly from the the inguinal ligament and this muscle also runs uh, over the canal and it forms the roof of this canal and then this internal oblique as well the transverse abdominis upon neurosis join together and form the conjoint tendon which is called as the conjoint tendon which form the posterior wall now if you can see this picture uh, this is one of the picture which i have taken uh, from the internet and you can see this is the anterior wall formed by the extra oblique muscle as well as its aponeurosis see the aponeurosis runs downwards twists inside and it forms the floor of this canal also then we have the posterior wall which is completely formed by the the transversalis fascia and partly by mm, the muscles we have already told and the internal oblique and transverse abdominis mainly form the roof as we have seen they will be running over the canal okay so the roof is formed by the arch fibers of the internal oblique as well as the transverse abdominis so internal oblique as well as the transverse abdominis arches over this roof and it forms the the roof of this canal okay and the floor as you already seen it is formed by the uh, grooved upper surface of the inguinal ligament so this external oblique muscle um, uh, runs downwards as aponeurosis and uh, this will form the the floor so it is formed by the grooved upper surface of the inguinal ligament which is nothing but the aponeurosis of the external oblique the posterior margin of which fuses with the fascia fascia transversal if you can see here the fascia transversal is coming down and this will join with the the floor of the inguinal canal medially the floor is formed by the upper surface of the lunate ligament in the, uh, here on the medial surface even the lunate ligament will form the the floor if not it is mainly by the the aponeurosis of the extra oblique muscle which form the floor okay so this is all about the, the anterior wall posterior wall roof and the floor so here also in this picture you can see uh, this is the transverse abdomen which is arching as well as even the internal oblique will arch and it forms the roof and partly it is anterior wall partly it is roof as well as the partly it is the posterior wall so it forms the internal oblique as well as the transverse abdominis mainly from the anti partly it forms the anterior wall partly it forms the roof as well as partly it also forms the the uh, posterior wall of the inguinal canal now we know that uh, the inguinal canal uh, contains two structures as we have already identified one is the spermatic cord in case of the male or uh, round ligament in case of the female and the second is the ilioinguinal nerve okay so one is the spermatic cord so what is the spermatic cord or what are the uh, constituents of the spermatic cord so that uh, that we will see now okay the first uh, important content of the spermatic cord is the vas deferens the main ductus deferens which will be carrying the the sperms uh, from the testis uh, to the external world okay so here you can see here this is the ductus deferens or uh, it is also called as the vas deferens the spermatic cord has been totally dissected and you can see one of the content of this will be the ductus deferens this is the picture again i have taken from, taken from the internet and this ductus deferens uh, is seen uh, this is the whole spermatic cord and one of the main content will be the ductus deferens Apart from this, there are some arteries which are present along with this uh, ductus deferens. So one is called as the art, uh, the testicular artery, very important artery which will be supplying the testis. So this is the testicular artery which is passing through this uh, spermatic cord and through the uh, the inguinal canal. The second important artery will be the cremastric artery, and the third artery will be the artery to the vas itself. So vas deferens is there. The artery to vas is also present in the same uh, spermatic cord apart from these arteries there is a uh, some important veins are also there one of the very important vein is the the pampaniform plexus as you know pampaniform plexus there is a plexus of vein which are around the the testis as well as even in case of the female around the ovaries 
The typical feature of this pamperiform plexus is they will drain into the uh, either testicular vein in case of the male or the ovarian vein in case of the female and on the right side this will be draining at an angle acute angle into the uh, inferior vena cava the testicular vein and on the left side it will draining at right angles to the uh, to the uh, left renal vein and it will be draining into the left renal vein and at an right angle okay so it is totally against the gravity and it has to drain into the uh, renal vein left renal vein and because it will be horizontal and this will be vertical so uh, the drainage will be of the venous drainage will be much more difficult and if there is a, a loss of potency of the the uh, the function of the valves then uh, it leads to varicosity of the vein and it is most commonly seen on the left side than on the right side because on the right um, because on the left side as i said it will draining the testicular vein will be draining at an angle of 90 degree into the renal vein and from there into the inferior vein cava so more pressure is needed and if there is a loss in the elasticity of the valves then it leads to varicosity of the veins and you can see it as a bag of worms on the left side especially because it is common on the more on common on the left side and it will be seen as a bag of worms and this is called as the varicose seal okay so the easily you can identify the varicose seal by the uh, the feature of bag of worms in the scrotum you feel as though there are bag of worms this is because of the the plexus which is formed by pamperiform plexus so clinically this pamperiform plexus is important and you should know that this uh, varicose seal is more common on the left side because the vein main vein which will be draining into uh, uh, the main vein which will be draining this pamperiform plexus will be the uh, the testicular vein the left testicular vein which opens into the left renal vein at an angle of 90 degree okay so it has to flow against the gravity okay so that's why it is more common on the left side so this is one of the important uh, pamperiform plexus which is an important vein plexus of vein present here along with that there are some lymphatics of the testes which are also uh, training uh, through this uh, spermatic cord and there are some important nerves also one of the very important nerve is the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve so this is the main nerve which will be supplying the the genital region as well as the even the testicular plexus of the sympathetic nerves especially coming from t10 as well as the sympathetic plexus around the artery of vas as you know around the artery there will be a plexus of nerves and uh, here also it is present especially around the artery of vas apart from that uh, all this content there is large quantity of or huge quantity of air la tissue which will help in the protection of this important structure the vast difference as well as the testicular artery and other structures which are passing through the spermatic cord so you should know the the contents of the spermatic cord one is the vast difference then the artery uh, especially arteries especially the testicular artery cumastic artery as well as the artery to vas then the veins especially the pamperiform plexus then the lymphatics to testes uh, draining from the testis and then some important nerves like the genital branch or genitofemoral nerve along with that the sympathetic nerve plexus can also be seen and um, and this all these are covered by a thick area you know, uh, uh, fat tissue which is around them okay so these are some of the contents of the spermatic cord now coming to something called as mechanism of inguinal canal usually as you know the inguinal canal will be closed with its content that is the uh, spermatic cord or the round ligament of uterus in case of the female as well as the ilioinguinal nerve with these two contents it will be usually closed okay uh, and this is important especially if it is patent or if the structures which are opening it if they are not strong enough then the uh, the contents especially which are there in the abdomen because of the increase intra uh, intra abdominal pressure these contents might pass through the inguinal canal and they might protrude out so there are some mechanisms which keep this inguinal canal close so what are these mechanisms we'll study them one by one 
The first mechanism which will keep the inguinal canal closed is the flap valve mechanism. This is, as you know, the, the superficial inguinal ring is superficial, uh, which is an opening in the external oblique, and the, uh, the deep inguinal ring is an opening within the transversalis fascia. Transversalis fascia is deep inside, and the superficial inguinal ring is superficial. So, if you see the canal, it will be uh, oblique in nature. Okay, so it is opening from the deep structures and it is opening superficially. Okay, so this obliquity of this inguinal canal, uh, this will uh, keep the uh, the canal close. And as you know, the deep inguinal ring is somewhere else. It is in near the midpoint of the inguinal ligament, and the superficial inguinal ring is near the pubic crust. Okay, so they are not in the same position. So if there is increase in the intra uh, intra abdominal pressure, then it leads to uh, um, all the muscles coming uh, um, in contact with the external oblique muscle and they will press and this um, even the openings will be closed by the increase in intra abdominal pressure so they all close this uh, 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 canal okay and because the uh, openings both the openings are not in the same line so the uh, contents do not protrude out but this whole canal will close so this is called as the flap valve mechanism the second mechanism is called as ball valve mechanism as you know in case of the male the cremastric muscle will be covering the 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 uh, uh, from the root up to the whole of the scrotum like this so if you can see here there is the the cremastric muscle which is coming and running downwards and it covers the whole of the spermatic cord as well as the in uh, the testis below the uh, root of the scrotum okay below the the opening superficial inguinal ring so it is totally covered by this muscle called as the chromastic muscle which is seen in case of males okay uh, this muscle uh, if you stroke this muscle with a pen or a sharp object then it leads to contraction of this muscle and this will pull the muscle upwards this is called as the chromastic reflex if you uh, just give a stroke on this muscle and then uh, just lateral to this uh, lateral to the scrotum then you can see that this muscle will contract and pull the testis upwards this pulling of the testis upwards and closing the inguinal the superficial inguinal ring this is called as uh, the the uh, the valve valve mechanism where this chromastic muscle will pull the the uh, testis itself upwards and it totally plugs or uh, blocks this superficial inguinal ring this is called as uh, the ball valve mechanism because this is the ball which will be pulled upwards and it closes the the superficial inguinal ring this is because of the the chromastic muscle with the chromastic reflex the third mechanism is called as shutter mechanism as you have seen the internal oblique as well as the transverse abdominal muscle they form the anterior wall the roof as well as the posterior wall okay these uh, two muscles especially the internal oblique because it forms the most of the uh, some especially the lateral part of the anterior wall the roof as well as the posterior wall this muscle because it is forming all so this muscle can be pulled down just like a shutter whenever this muscle contracts so this will be pulled downwards and it totally blocks this canal so this is called as the shutter mechanism this is because of the the uh, relation of the internal oblique to the uh, the inguinal canal it forms the anterior wall the roof as well as the posterior wall so whenever it is pulled down because of the pressure or contraction of the internal oblique then it totally blocks this canal so this is called a shutter mechanism which again prevents the hernia formation of hernias then there is also something called as the slit valve mechanism where uh, approximation of the two crore of the external oblique if you know the external oblique will split here into two and this canal will be in between them okay the superficial inguinal ring will be between the two splits of the the extra oblique muscle when it is getting inserted it splits into two these are called as the two crore of the extra oblique muscle so this um, whenever the extra oblique muscle contracts these two crura will come or approach each other they come closer and they totally block the the superficial inguinal ring so this is called as the slit valve mechanism because it is slit between the the two crura of the external oblique muscle 
which will uh, try to uh, close whenever there is contraction of the external oblique. So these are some of the mechanisms by which the uh, the inguinal canal is kept close, but still there might be uh, hernias because of uh, uh, because of the loss of uh, these mechanisms, one or more of these mechanisms. Okay, and the main uh, uh, finally uh, the important. Uh, hormones which will again strengthen the the uh, anti abdominal muscles those are also important part for this thing uh, cannot to be um, um, prevent uh, hernias okay so these are some of the mechanism by which the inguinal canal is kept close one is the flap valve mechanism which is also because of the obliquity of the uh, the canal the superficial and deep inguinal ring are different position the second is the bulb valve mechanism because of the chromatic muscle which uh, with the chromatic reflex will pull the testes the third is the shutter mechanism the different position of the internal oblique anterior roof as well as the posterior wall whenever whenever it is pulled it uh, falls down like a shutter which will pull pull down and close the canal then slit valve mechanism the uh, there are two insertion of the external oblique uh, which splits and get inserted uh, and this uh, superficial inguinal ring will be in between the two slits of the external oblique so whenever the external oblique is uh, contracted it will close the superficial inguinal try to close the superficial inguinal uh, ring okay and the hormones which will strengthen the anti abdominal wall okay now coming to something called uh, hernias hernias as you know these are the abnormal protrusion of the abdominal contents through this canal as you have seen the canal is prevented from uh, uh, protrusion of any content from the abdominal content through this canal but sometimes even then there might be loss of this mechanism and there might be protrusion of the abdominal contents like the intestine the urine bladder or something like that and this might uh, protrude out through the anti abdominal wall that is called as hernia this is abnormal protrusion of the abdominal contents through the anti abdominal wall so now there are different types of hernias okay uh, uh, especially we should know the inguinal hernia this inguinal hernia is called inguinal hernia because it passes through the inguinal ring okay superficial and deep inguinal ring sometimes uh, both sometimes only one Okay, and it is above the inguinal uh, uh, ligament, so that's what is called as inguinal hernias. Okay, now we should know what are the different types of inguinal hernias and other hernias. One is the inguinal hernia, as I said, they, they might be direct as well as indirect inguinal hernias. Apart from that, there are uh, reducible hernias. These hernias sometimes they can be reduced when the person lies down it can be reduced automatically or with some manual pressure you might reduce the hernia sometimes they are irreducible you cannot reduce the hernias when the contents come out of the abdominal anti-abdominal wall then they will stay there okay you cannot reduce it with pressure or by lying down the most important as well as complicated one is the strangulated hernia where the the hernia is not only irreducible but it is totally strangulated that might block the arteries and that leads to gangrene and this uh, uh, might lead to peritonitis and death of the person so the most complicated one will be the the strangulated hernia where the arteries are blocked once the hernia is there if you can see here this is uh, the hernia internal inguinal ring which is blocking this is the loop of intestine which is passing through it and this is uh, um, uh, the ring and sometimes this ring becomes uh, fastened or tightened which leads to blocking of the arteries which are supplying this part of the intestine that leads to gangrene okay again the uh, direct hernias are again direct divided into direct and uh, direct medial as well as direct lateral and indirect hernias will be uh, divided into congenital hernia congenital funicular hernias infantile hernias interstitial hernias as well as the will be no seen okay now we should know what exactly is the uh, direct and indirect inguinal hernias this picture uh, uh, actually uh, uh, differentiate between the direct and indirect hernia okay so what is this direct and indirect so we have seen that one of the very important artery which will be supplying the anti abdominal wall will be the inferior epigastric artery which is coming from below and the superior epigastric artery which is coming uh, from above which both will anastomose so if you see inferiorly this inferior epigastric artery 
will be present here and the content if the abdominal content protrude out medial to that then it is called as the direct and if it is uh, uh, protruding, uh, protruding you know, from the lateral side of the inferior periogastric artery then it is called as the indirect inguinal hernia okay what exactly does it mean it means that if the contents passes through the deep inguinal ring then pass through the canal and comes out through the superficial inguinal ring then it is called as indirect hernia okay so once again i repeat if the structures or the contents of the abdomen pass through the deep inguinal ring and then pass through the inguinal canal and comes out through the superficial inguinal ring and they uh, descend into the scrotum uh, 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 somewhere else uh, on the anti-abdominal wall from the superficial inguinal ring then it is called as the indirect hernia sometimes what happens because of the weakness of the anti-abdominal wall some of the contents directly uh, press on the anti-abdominal wall or they invaginate into the anti-abdominal wall and they directly come to the superficial inguinal ring without passing through the deep inguinal ring okay so these are called as direct inguinal hernias so direct inguinal hernias are medial to the inferior epigastric artery because they are directly protruding, protruding out through the and weakness of the anti-abdominal wall and then they come to the superficial inguinal ring but in case of the indirect uh, hernias they pass through the proper passage that is deep inguinal ring then the inguinal canal and then uh, comes out to the superficial inguinal ring so that's why they are on the lateral side lateral to the inferior epigastric artery indirect hernias and direct hernias are medial to the inferior epigastric artery okay so this about the to differentiate between the uh, the anti uh, the direct as well as the indirect hernias there are other types of hernia which you should know uh, we will not go into detail just we will uh, mention them okay one of the type of hernia is the epigastric hernias okay and sometimes there might be uh, hernias through the umbilical uh, uh, cord uh, uh, umbilical cord and this is called as the umbilical hernias some uh, these are the uh, inguinal hernias which i will talked about similarly there is a femoral canal in, in the medial part of the high uh, thigh and from there there might be uh, uh, again protrusion of the content that is called as the femoral hernia okay apart from that there are some hernias called as incisional hernias as i said before there is at the center the two aponeurosis of the uh, two sides of the anti-abdominal wall muscles external oblique internal oblique transverse abdominis they fuse in the midline and then i said that is called as the linea alba so that is the least vascular structure so previously what the surgeon used to do is they used to do surgeries on this least vascular area that is uh, the on the linea alba but the disadvantage of uh, less vascularity is even the healing will be very less as well as weak so that leads to, led to the uh, uh, hernias through this uh, uh, incised part those are called as the incisional hernias they can be seen in other parts also like in this picture the incision is somewhere else but still there can be hernias from the other side also but this is most commonest if you do it on the linea alba the hernias in, incisional hernias are very common okay but it can be seen on the other parts also if you are doing nowadays they have totally stopped doing surgeries on this linea alba because this leads to a lot of complication especially the incisional hernia now they uh, cut the other parts of the abdomen uh, there can be hernias but they are rare compared to the linea alba so these are called as the incisional hernias now coming to the last part of this lecture that is the difference between the direct as well as the indirect hernias so what are the differences we have studied uh, uh, the difference what exactly is the difference between direct and indirect uh, we should know more of those details so what are the differences okay one is in case of the indirect hernia the hernial sac enters through the inguinal canal through the deep inguinal ring as we have seen it passes through the proper passage it passes through the uh, the deep inguinal ring then passes through the inguinal canal and comes out to the superficial inguinal ring that is called as the indirect hernia okay so even the hernial sac enters through the but in case of the direct hernia uh, this uh, hernial sac uh, passes through uh, the inguinal triangle of Hasselbeck. What is this Hasselbeck's triangle? 
so going back to this again this picture okay uh, we have seen on the lateral side of the direct hernia we have this inferior epigastric artery okay medially we have the linea alba and below we have the inguinal canal okay or the inguinal ligament to be more specific okay this is the inguinal ligament so these three boundaries will uh, uh, form and this triangle is called as the Hasselbach's triangle so Hasselbach's triangle is a triangle uh, the boundaries are on the lateral side we have the inferior epigastric artery here it actually it will be running like this okay inferior epigastric artery on the medial side we have the uh, the uh, linea alba and inferiorly or the floor will be formed by the the inguinal ligament okay so this triangle is called as the the Hasselbach's triangle so this is this Hasselbach's triangle so this hernia will be entering through the the Hasselbach's triangle okay directly through the Hasselbach's triangle and comes out through the superficial inguinal ring but in case of the indirect hernia it passes through a deep inguinal ring passes through the whole of the inguinal canal and then comes out the, through the superficial inguinal ring okay the second difference is the neck of the hernial sac lies lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. Going back again to, the, to this picture, so the uh, the in case of the indirect hernia, the contents the uh, the hernial sac will be lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. Okay, but in case of the direct hernia, it will be medial to the inferior epigastric artery. So this is the uh, second difference. One is uh, the hernial sac will be passing through the whole canal, but in case of direct hernia, it will pass through the Hasselbach's triangle. Second, the hernial sac will be lateral to the, the inferior epigastric artery, but in case of the direct hernia, it will be coming from medial to the inferior epigastric artery with the picture we have understood. The third is the in case of the indirect hernia, this is usually unilateral and this is especially in case of engage, especially it will be genital, congenital okay it will be congenital sorry it will be congenital and usually it will be unilateral especially because if the the part of the peritoneum when the testes descend downwards it pulls a part of the peritoneum that is called as the process vaginalis sometime this process vaginalis will be patent that is called as the patent process vaginalis if it is patent then the contents will be passing through easily coming and going through it okay so that is called as reducible hernia okay so this is common especially and even the other types uh, because of the congenital uh, uh, formation so that's why this will be seen in the indirect hernias will be seen in the engage and usually it is unilateral but in case of the direct hernia this is because of the weakness of the anti-abdominal wall this is usually seen in the old age so that's why it will be common direct hernias will be usually on the old age and because there is a weakness in the anti-abdominal wall it will be bilateral because weakness is on both the sides so usually it will be bilateral so direct hernias will be bilateral and it is in common in the old age but in case of indirect hernias it will be common in the engage and it has to uh, it will be usually unilateral usually okay and as i said the congenital hernias will be usually the cause might be congenital but in case of the direct hernia because it is uh, because of the weakness of the anti-abdominal wall this is usually acquired in case of the indirect hernias uh, it will receive all the coverings of this spermaticoid because it is passing through the deep inguinal ring then through a canal and coming out through the superficial inguinal ring it will be taking all its uh, coverings along with that but in case of the direct hernias, this will not take all the, it will not receive all the coverings because it is directly protruding through the anti-abdominal wall and comes out through the superficial inguinal ring. The last is the direction of this hernia. It will be in case of direct hernia, indirect hernia, because it is coming from the lateral to medial side from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. So it will be directed downwards, forwards, as well as directed medially. But in case of the direct hernia, because it is directly protruding out through the uh, the uh, superficial inguinal ring after the uh, protruding through the anti-abdominal wall then this will be directly straight forward okay so this is the direction of the uh, uh, the opening of this hernias okay so these are some of the differences between the indirect and direct hernia okay so here this is picture uh, again from the grace anatomy so it is showing you uh, the uh, deeping uh, the uh, indirect hernias from the uh, 
differentiating between the indirect and direct hernia. In case of the indirect hernia, it is passing through the deep inguinal ring, then passes through the superficial inguinal ring, and then it is coming descending into the scrotum. Okay, so here you can see this is the peritoneal sac, and this is because of the patency of the process vaginalis. But in case of the direct hernia, instead of passing through a deep inguinal ring, it is not passing through a deep inguinal ring, but it is directly protruding through the the weakness of the wall of the anti-abdominal wall and then it comes out to the superficial inguinal ring so this is how uh, there is difference between the indirect hernias and the direct hernias now coming to the uh, final uh, slide where uh, how to differentiate between uh, indirect and direct hernia clinically i will not go there are different methods but one method is by applying first ask the person to uh, lie down radio in case especially in case of reducible hernia uh, you have to ask the person to lie down as well as uh, 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 check whether the all the contents have gone bang if not manually reduce and uh, re totally reduce the hernia once it is reduced now apply the pressure on the uh, midpoint of the inguinal ligament as you know this opening the deep inguinal ring is uh, just uh, behind the uh, midpoint of the inguinal ligament okay so just apply pressure on that uh, uh, deep inguinal ring and then ask the person to stand and cough apply pressure on the abdomen if this content is uh, coming from the deep inguinal ring that is indirect hernia then because of this pressure the contents will not come down they cannot descend downwards into the canal and from there into superficial inguinal ring so usually there is a hernia but with this pressure after reducing then the contents cannot come into the scrotum then it is uh, identified that it is indirect hernia but in case of the direct hernia because it is not coming through the deep inguinal ring it is not coming through the deep inguinal ring but because of the weakness of the anti-abdominal wall itself so they directly protrude out through the anti-abdominal wall into the superficial inguinal ring so if this content of the, of the abdominal content protrude out and there is formation of the hernia there is appearance of the hernia uh, over the scrotum or th over the superficial inguinal ring then it means that this is a uh, direct hernia because it is coming not from the deep inguinal ring but it is directly from the uh, the weakness of the anti-abdominal wall so this is how you can identify the direct hernia and differentiate from the direct hernia from that of the indirect hernia just uh, reduce the hernia and apply pressure and ask the person to cough as well as stand so if the content comes out to the hernia then it is uh, direct hernia and if it doesn't come out then it means that it is indirect hernia okay so this is all about the anterior abdominal wall as well as the inguinal hernias as well as uh, the, uh, to the uh, st uh, steps how you can differentiate between direct and indirect hernia. Coming uh, lastly to the lymphatic drainage as you know uh, this whole of this lower part of the abdomen especially uh, below the umbilicus will be draining into the, the superficial inguinal group of lymph nodes. As you know there are vertical groups as well as the horizontal group. So even the horizontal group is divided into upper medial as well as the upper lateral. So these are the group of lymph nodes where the lymphatic drainage of the lower part of the uh, anti-abdominal wall as well as even the lower limbs will be. Okay. So this is all about the anti-abdominal wall as well as the inguinal hernia. So if you have any uh, questions, you can just write to me and I will try to answer. So these are my references, mainly the pictures are from the Grace Anatomy and some other textbooks as well as from the uh, internet. Thank you very much.